Anybody heard from Kellen? Is he coming tonight? I haven't heard otherwise. Okay. We've got a couple of minutes. Yeah. Well, obviously I have the best tie on tonight. <laughs> you do. <laughs> you like it, Peter? It's Armani. It's very nice. It's very nice. Thank you. And it's nice to see you, Commissioner. Thank you so much. You're always a snappy dresser. <clears throat> Garrett, you get your car back? Is everything repaired? Like brand new. I'm shocked. Can't cleaner, than, cleaner than before? Yeah, better than before. Thanks for asking. Getting 36 miles per gallon. I'm very pleased. Hey. I clocked in at 89.3 miles per gallon on the drive home today. Different car. I know. Well, that means you should all be buying uh, Tesla stock. There's I don't a know. There was just an election in Bolivia. They had supported a... Oh, we're live. I won't talk about unrelated stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so at 7 o'clock... All this meeting of the City of West Hollywood Rent Stabilization Commission to order. Uh, can we have the Pledge of Allegiance? Commissioner um, Maji, would you like to lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Mr. Secretary, can we have a, um, a roll call, please? Commissioner Charity? Here. Commissioner Kirby's Present. Commissioner Maggio. Here. Commissioner Marks. Not present. Uh, Commissioner O'Keefe. Here. Vice Chair Topshin. Absent. Uh, Chair Bergstein. Present. We have a quorum. Going on to item four, approval of our agenda. Everyone had a chance to review tonight's agenda. Uh, entertain a motion to accept as submitted. Make a motion to accept the agenda as submitted. Is this where we would offer adjournment request? Or no, no. no, no? Okay. I'll second Commissioner O'Keefe's motion. A roll call vote, please. Commissioner Charity? Aye. Commissioner Kirby's? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Commissioner O'Keefe? Aye. Chair Bergstein. Aye. Passes. Going on to item five, approval of our minutes from the September 24th, 2020 meeting. We all had a chance to review the minutes from our last meeting. Any uh, corrections or additions? I was not present, so I will not vote. Okay. Is there a motion to approve as submitted? Yes, Chair, I'll make a motion to approve as submitted. Is there a second? Second. Okay. You have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Charity? Aye. Commissioner Kirby's? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Commissioner Marks? Commissioner Marks? Here. Can you hear us, Commissioner? Maybe. He's frozen. He's frozen. Hmm. Here he is. Commissioner Marks, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. I will say aye if we're looking for that. Okay. Commissioner O'Keefe? Aye. Uh, Chair Bergstein? Aye. Minutes are approved. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do we have any public comments so far this evening? Not at this time. Thank you. And on to item seven, our manager's report, Mr. Noonan. <clears throat> Thank you and good evening. Uh, a review of your look ahead calendar shows that uh, your next meeting on November 12th does have two appeals, D4528 and D4548. Uh, On your December 10th meeting, 
uh, you have one appeal, D4536, and uh, we'll provide a discussion item, which is information on the rent stabilization ordinance deposit interest formula. Uh, you'll notice that there's just one meeting in November uh, because the commission uh, traditionally meets on the first and second, second and fourth Thursdays of the month, that second meeting is Thanksgiving. And so that is a month that has one meeting. Um, so these two meetings, the 12th and the 10th, conclude uh, this year's, this calendar year's meetings for the Rent Stabilization Commission. Following, uh, we have populated the look ahead calendar with the 2021 meetings beginning in January through March. And we've scheduled two discussion items on the January 14th meeting so far. That concludes my report. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Noonan at this time? Thank you, Mr. Noonan. I do. I'm sorry, I got cut off for some reason. Can you just tell me again the meetings in November and December? Of course. Uh, we have the meeting of November 12th, and there's two yeah. uh, items on that agenda, and the meeting on December 10th. Uh, we have one agenda item and we'll have a discussion item, which is information on the rent stabilization ordinance deposit interest formula. Thank you for the clarification. You're very welcome. I do have one question. So uh, when does the, uh, when do we announce the uh, interest rate for the year? We will do that typically right at the beginning of January. Okay. Um, can we not move this any later than what it's already? I mean, I know I think we've already missed it for uh, to affect any change for 2020, but um, that was my point of bringing it up over a year ago was so that we could get it ahead of time in case we wanted to take action uh, and the council wanted to take action. Um, but if we can just make sure that we don't move it any later than what it's already on, that'd be great. Yes, we can keep it firm on that meeting date. Any further questions for Mr. Noonan at this point? Going to item eight, commission comments. Commissioner O'Keefe. Yeah, I wanted to offer an adjournment motion in memory of uh, Commissioner Maggio's late brother, Bert, who passed away on September 19th. I would second that. Commissioners, any other comments? Commissioner Maggio. Yes, I'd like to mention that it seems to be a lot of extra work for the commission secretary to call a roll call on agenda and minutes. It's usually suffice to just say all in favor, aye, and then all opposed. And then you just simply post the, uh, the opposed. But I don't think a roll call is necessary for either one of those agenda items. Well, I appreciate that, Commissioner Maggio. That is instruction from the city clerk. Yvonne Quirk said that we need to do a roll call vote for each item on the agenda. I know in, in past it was just kind of all in favor, all opposed, but she's asked for clarity of the record that we have a roll call vote for each and every agenda item. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I also have an adjournment motion um, to sadly, in memory of uh, Tom West, who was um, very long time employee of the city, long time city clerk, uh, passed away two weeks ago in Palm Springs. Tom was um, just an extraordinary compassionate man, uh, ran the city and its meetings uh, like clockwork. Um, for me was famous for saying, you know, Rob, you can't do that, but here's what you can do. Um, Tom, I think was the happiest retiree I have met in my life, retiring to Palm Springs. And, you know, Tom is about three inches shorter than me, bought an Airstream trailer and a big Toyota truck and was driving up and down the coast uh, with his beloved dog, uh, visiting former um, city employees and friends all up and down the coast. Um, and I'm greatly saddened of his, padding, of his passing. It was a, a life very well lived and a life cut far too short. So I would also like to offer an adjournment motion in memory of former city clerk, Tom West. I'd say Tom was the happiest person to or, uh ever, like not just retired, but just happiest person ever. <laughs> Commissioners, any further comments at this point? I'm going to our appeal. We have one appeal this evening, D-4539, 9004 Dick Street. The appeal was filed by um, the uh, property owner's representative, Nanette Burke. Is uh, Nanette Burke or a representative present? Yes, all parties are present. I'll admit them now. Okay, and the tenant is, is Barbara uh, 
latest. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, both Chair. Talking. Chair, yes. The, the, the people that will be coming in uh, representing the Nanak Burke are Alan Zemenik and uh, uh, Philip, I didn't catch his last name, I apologize, but uh, there has been a property change and so there is a new owner. The representative Alan Zemenik will lead that side. And then coming in uh, representing uh, Barbara Latus is John Corbel and the tenant Barbara Latus. Okay. I'll try and keep it's Philip Kang uh, with Alan Zemenik. I'll try and keep those names straight. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. for all the parties, the way this will work this evening is our staff attorney, Ms. Regan, will make a report to the commission. At that point, the commissioners will have the opportunity to ask questions of the attorney. And then uh, we'll open it up for your discussion. Since this was filed by the, um, I guess the current property owners, uh, you will go first. You will have a total of five minutes to speak. You can divide your time between an initial um, period and save time for rebuttal if you would like. And then uh, for the tenant, you will have a total of five minutes. I do wanna caution all parties that we are an appellate body. We may only discuss or review what is currently in the record up to the date of the hearing. So anything that took place after the date of the hearing, anything that was remembered after that is not relevant to this. We are just a, uh, a body that's going to review the record. So if you start to veer off into new territory, I am going to interrupt and that will just cut your time shorter. With that, Ms. Regan, staff report, please. Thank you. Uh, in this case, uh, the landlord purported to increase the rent from uh, the current amount, which is 1,184 to uh, $3,300. Uh, and claimed that they could do that because uh, they were exempt from the local rent stabilization ordinance uh, because of provisions uh, in a state law called Costa Hawkins. Um, just briefly, uh, there are two grounds that must be satisfied before uh, the property can be exempt from the, from the rent stabilization ordinance. And in this case, uh, that is that the property is a single family residence and that the tenancy began after December. In this case, the hearing examiner found that this was not a single family residence. And so therefore, uh, the local our, our ordinance applied on that basis. Um, staff, on the other hand, uh, found that this was a single family residence, but that the other condition was not satisfied. So staff uh, found that because the tenancy began prior to December 31st, 1995, uh, that is another basis uh, on which the local our, our local ordinance can apply. So in fact, the property is not exempt uh, and this tenancy is not exempt from the rent limitations of the rent stabilization ordinance. So it's on that basis that the staff is recommending that the ultimate conclusion of the hearing examiner be upheld, but that it be upheld on a different ground than what the hearing examiner found. Uh, the second issue that was appealed was the base rent. The hearing examiner found that he could not make a finding as to the base rent. Uh, staff recommends that the commission reverse the hearing examiner's decision uh, because the paperwork and the parties both agree that uh, the base rent was in fact listed on the initial registration form. So for that reason, uh, staff recommends that the commission uh, find differently from the hearing examiner on that basis. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have questions for staff? Commissioner Kirpies? You need to unmute yourself, sir. Thank you. There you go. The hearing examiner uh, determined that they were not exempt from the uh, our rent stabilization ordinance uh, for both reasons or for the wrong reason? I mean, well, he didn't, he didn't need to reach the second reason because he found 
that the first reason uh, applied. The first reason under his decision was that uh, it was not a single family home? Correct. So he didn't, in his decision, decide that also it, like he didn't go the next step to say also it wouldn't apply because of uh, the tenancy when this tenancy started. Um, he did discuss the fact that uh, this is where it gets a little bit complicated because he went into uh, an alternate reason, uh, which is uh, that there was only a partial change in occupancy. So he did talk about the fact that this is a continuation of the original tenancy, but ultimately, um, and I think he only discussed that a different provision, which is a different provision of Costa Hawkins uh, as support for his finding uh, that this was a single family residence. I think the grounds that he ultimately made his determination were the were um, subsection A of 1954.53, and I and I understand that this is this is getting really into the weeds of of Costa Hawkins, and so feel free to ask whatever questions you might have. And I guess kind of my ultimate question of where I was trying to get was, would the commission? Uh, does the commission have to opine on the determination whether it was a uh, single family or not? Uh, uh, and, and just instead of deleting his uh, or over, overturning his decision and say, if we chose to go with the reason that um, staff is recommending that it was because of the tenancy, when the tenancy started, that was the reason why it's not excluded. Do we have to comment on the first part? That's kind of my question. Uh, well, yes, you do. A and the reason is because the only reason why, in order for it to matter, I guess, uh, the date of the tenancy would be as if the commission first found uh, that it was a single family home. So um, Costa Hawkins exempts certain types of property from the rent stabilization ordinance. Uh, otherwise we're into subsection B, which talks about exceptions for multi, excuse me, multifamily residential uh, buildings. So if the commission finds that this is a single family residence, then the commission will look at, well, even though it's a single family residence, is there still another element of this that nonetheless um, means that the RSO still applies, if that makes sense? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Maggio? Yes, Allison. So uh, to me, this obviously was a single family home, and then they decided to add a room, and because they wanted to really have it both ways, either to uh, use it as a guest room or sometimes rent it. And of course, the, the law was so different 25 years ago. And, but, uh, and so that's what I think. It's like kind of wanted it both ways. Do you have a question for Ms. Regan? Commissioner Maggio, do you have a question for Ms. Regan? Sorry, I'm sorry, my audio went off. I could hardly, I'll just leave it. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions for Ms. Regan at this point? Then we'll go into the parties discussion. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the last names quickly enough, but Alan and Philip are evidently representing the new owner. Can you just kind of raise your hands that you can, you can hear me? Okay. Yes, so uh, when each of you speak, if you just state for the record, your name, your city of residence, and whoever speaks first, how you'd like to divide your time up. You can use your entire five minutes for the beginning. You can reserve time for rebuttal. It's totally up to you. Uh, thank you. Should I go ahead now? Sure. Should I proceed? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Alan Zemek. I'm here representing Nanette Burke. Uh, I'm actually a real estate broker, part of a property management company, uh, and we were involved to 
help the owner deal with um, some of the issues in this case. And I would like to reserve some time for rebuttal. What's your city of residence, sir? I'm sorry? The city of residence. Oh, Laguna Niguel. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'd like to just recap briefly why we're here is we have an unusual set of facts that the original tenant is deceased. The original landlord is deceased. Uh, we have a successor trustee with very limited information uh, and a change in ownership along the way. Uh, and no written lease to guide us to uh, what determination should be made and what the facts are. Um, it started off as a very simple question. What is the maximum allowable rent for this property? Um, and I just like to state that Miss Burke acted entirely in good faith here, believing this to be a single family house because the original tenancy the registration, um, the attendant herself has always asserted that she has total control over the premises. Um, it's always been treated as one tenancy and one lease uh, going back to 1986. Um, the landlord never rented out any of, you know, what quote unquote, the back unit or a bedroom, um, any additional roommates that may have come and gone over the years. Uh, those were entirely at the control of the tenant in possession. Um, you know, for, for the purposes of this hearing, um, we, we have some unknowns and we're hoping the, the commission will give us some clarity. Um, you know, we don't have any bad behavior or retaliation or predatory practices or abuse uh, that the commission needs to redress. Uh, but because of the limited um, written record, we're relying on the facts that we do know that it was registered as a single family house. There's only been one tenancy uh, and the tenant has always asserted that she has total control and possession of the house. Um, so our, obviously we would be here advocating that the commission adopt the staff report that to determine that there was a base rent established and it is and has been and always been treated so as a single family residence. Um, I, I, we have some, some concerns about the classification of the tenancy uh, and how the tenant is choosing to um, operate the home, if you will. Um, any subtenancies or guests or um, rent that she's collecting from subtenants, none of that was ever disclosed to the owner uh, that we know. And in fact, the tenant worked very hard to conceal that information from us. Uh, and in the record, there's several statements where she signs her name to a document that says, I'm the sole occupant of this house. Um, and, and, and I think... <laughs> I think the work of this commission, which is a, an important instrument of public policy, you, you rely on those who come seeking your redress to be completely transparent and forthcoming in their testimony. Uh, and I think part of the reason this has gotten so complicated and convoluted is, is we've not had that uh, in this particular set of circumstances. Um, so our, our conclusion would be that uh, we would ask the commission to provide some clarity here so that we can decide what our, our, our future options may be that as the staff report recommends, this is a single family house. It always has been so and has been treated as such uh, and that there really is only one tenancy here that we're, that we're, that we're dealing with, that we need to, to resolve what the terms are. Uh, and the original simple question is what is the maximum allowable rent? Uh, and in good faith, that's I believe the answer we're hoping the commission will provide for us. Um, at this point, I'd like to stop and reserve time for a rebuttal. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Zemek at this point? Commissioner Kirpies. Yes, thank you. Um, so if, we're, if the commission were to, um, if we were to stipulate at the very beginning of this that uh, it was a single family home, um, are you disputing the date of the tenancy and that it's a single, that it's a, a long lasting tenancy, that's a continuation of a tenancy? I, I think the record is clear that there's only been one tenancy in all the years that this home has been rented as a single family home. Um, as as Ms. Reagan, I believe it was said, there's two parts to the analysis. Is it a single family home and is it exempt? And is the tenancy exempt? Um, the, the, the facts seem to be pretty clear that the current tenant was the successor to the original tenant who passed. Uh, and as an immediate family member, uh, I believe that would um, 
be the correct conclusion to say, well, this is a continuation of the existing tenancy. I honestly, in all fairness, I think that'd be hard to dispute. Um, our, our concern here is that uh, the tenant has actively concealed the fact that she's subleasing out part of the house. And, and that. that's a problem because there's, there's health and liability safety issues that uh, are of, of, of an ancillary concern. So my second question is, um, uh, if we were to uh, all agree that there was one tenancy, a continuation of one tenancy, then what are you suggesting is the, um, the base rent? Um, because there's been two numbers really discussed. It's the 1150, I believe, and the 1184.50. I could be off on those numbers, but. Um, yeah, the, the original base rent that's in the record of the proceedings was 1150. The current rent that the tenant is paying is 1184. Okay. Uh, and it just so we, was it just through inattention or incapacity, the landlord just never raised it. So would you, if 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 all that's correct, if, would you say that the base rent? Are you are you saying the base rent would be one one thousand one hundred and fifty? That's what the record says. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, any further questions for Mr. Zamek? Okay. Then we'll go on to the tenant, Mr. Corbel. Are you speaking on behalf of uh, Ms. Latest this evening? You need to unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, I am. Thank you. If you just state your name and city of residence, and then you have a total of five minutes, sir. John Corbel, Burbank, California. Uh, I'm still not clear from the staff report or from Ms. Regan's oral uh, presentation today whether the commission's poised to rule against the tenant on this case or not. Uh, on the ultimate question of whether this is a rent controlled property. Um, if you're poised to uh, rule against the tenant, I would urge you uh, not to do so, uh, chiefly on the ground that there is an argument I made at the hearing. Um, I'm arguing that the doctrine of equitable estoppel stops the uh, landlord from denying that this is a rent controlled property. This is an argument I explicitly raised at the hearing. Uh, the, hearing examiner did not address it in his decision, possibly because he ruled in favor of the tenant on other grounds, I don't know. Uh, but I believe that uh, the landlord would be found to be stopped from asserting otherwise. And so the, if, if the tenant is going to lose here today, then I think the matter should be remanded to the hearing officer for a decision on that issue, which I raised. It's not a new issue, no new evidence would be required. Uh, I just would, think that uh, my client is entitled to a finding on that issue if she's going to lose on the other grounds. Um, secondly, um, there's no evidence that this is anything other than a two unit structure. Uh, it's always been two units. Ms. Light has testified to that. Nobody else testified to the contrary. No one else has any personal knowledge of any other contrary conclusion. Um, She's the only one with, who's a precipient witness who knows this. Uh, Dick Herman, who also knew it, is deceased now. Uh, the fact that he filed a registration form in uh, 19, was it 1990, listing this as a three bedroom house, it, it's a, it, it was referring to the main house only. He built the back house himself without the benefit of a building permit. He was concealing its, its existence from the city. This is a fraudulent document that he filed and it does not stand as positive evidence for finding that this is a single family home. It's a, it's a detached house, detached structure containing two dwelling, two dwelling units. Therefore, it, it is not a single family residence under the city of Hollywood's own definition of what a single family residence is. Uh, there's always been a back unit um, and there is now. And there's a tenant back there. There was not a tenant back there on January 6, 2020. So I resent and um, strongly contest the fact that there's been any active concealment by my client. There was no tenant back there on January 2020 when she filed or when she provided a form to the landlord saying that she was the only tenant. At the time, that was true. Uh, now there's another tenant back there in the back unit, and she disclosed this at the hearing. So it's an outrageous accusation that there's been any concealment by my client about the facts of this case. Um, 
she never she never asserted that it was a single family residence in anything that she filled out. Uh, if if Nanette Burke didn't know about the back unit, that's because her uncle didn't tell her about it, not because Barbara Lightus concealed it. Nanette Burke never asked Barbara Lightus about the back unit. She never availed herself of any opportunity to inspect the premises when she had a chance to do so. Um, so uh, there's, there's been no concealment here. It's a single family house. Um, we think the conclusions of the hearing officer should be affirmed, the legal conclusions of law. We think the Owens case does apply. Uh, once again, uh, the analysis by the staff, I think, ignores the fact that the definition of rental unit in uh, paragraph 18 of your ordinance uh, simply means a dwelling unit rented or offered for human habitation. It's not limited to the landlord offering it for human habitation or renting. It's it, anybody can do it according to your own uh, ordinance, which the commission should be enforcing on its own terms without supplying additional language. Uh, the Owens case does not stand uh, as uh, cannot be distinguished on its facts because um, the Rent Hollywood re uh, ordinance on definition on rental units uh, uh, is different than the one up in Oakland. Um, so that's what um, I've got to say. Now I can answer questions if there's any. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Corbel at this time? Commissioner Martz? Yes, just briefly. Would you, for, I'm a visual learner, will you um, explain the structure of the building? You're saying it's a two bedroom, one bath home with a detached unit, or can you explain a little bit for us? No, it's a three bedroom house. The main house is three bedrooms. Uh, and the landlord knows this. They had uh, given access. <laughs> Just, just describe the, the building. I just need to visualize it. I don't care about the landlord, please. There's three, there's three bedrooms in the main house and then attached to the main house when the, the old landlord built it is a separate unit, basically one bedroom uh, and a kitchenette and a bath, a full bath behind it. Okay, got it, understood, thank you. Commissioner Maggio. Yes, to the gentleman, but the room or the unit is attached by wall to the house. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Mr. Cordell, I have one question. Perhaps I misunderstood you, but you seem to contradict yourself. In the beginning of your testimony, you said it is a single family residence and later you said it's two units. It can't be both. How do you perceive this property? I must have misspoken. It's not a single family residence. Uh, I must have been referring to the regulation possibly. Um, it does not fit the definition of a single family residence because it is two units. Thank you. Sorry. Mr. Maggio? Mr. Maggio, are you raising your hand? No? Commissioner Kirby. No, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Commissioner Kirby. Uh, uh, Mr. Corbel, I didn't quite understand your your this the statement you made when you were talking about the case. Um, so are you saying that uh, the case in Oakland doesn't apply because or that it does apply because um, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a rental or a, uh, a habitable unit, or are you saying that uh, we need to look at our law? How, how does our law, uh, that's what I'm confused about, is what are we looking at to determine whether uh, this is multi-family and that the law in Oakland, should, or the decision in the Oakland case should apply? I'm saying it does apply, sorry if I wasn't clear. I'm saying it does apply. The appellant, and um, in a view as endorsed by the staff, distinguishes that case from this case, saying that in that case up in Oakland, the rental units were created by the landlord, by the property owner. And the argument is that that didn't happen here. It was the tenant that created subtenancy in the back. Therefore, the Brown case doesn't apply. But when you go to your own definition of rental units, there's no such limitation in there. It doesn't say a rental unit has to be created by the property owner. But and why does that case, support your argument? Why does our law uh, stating that it's a defining, defining it as a unit, why does that make Oakland uh, the ruling apply? That's what I'm not understanding is the, the leap you're making there to connect those, the case and... It, it renders that distinction that the uh, appellants and the staff are making 
uh, legally insignificant for West Hollywood. The distinction that the property owner has to create the re rental unit, that distinction does not appear in your ordinance. But isn't that the distinction that was made in the court case? Not nearly, no. They, that's part of the facts of the case, but nowhere in that case does it say, we make this ruling only because the property owner created these tenancies, or nor do they state this case applies only in cases where the property owner creates tenancies and in no other instance. They didn't say that. It's just a fact arising out of the fact pattern. It's not part of the decision. It's not part of what makes this uh, precedential. It's, it's, it's a ruling um, based on the facts of that case, which are slightly different from the facts of this case, but your own ordinance makes those factual differences irrelevant. Thank you. Yes, I have a question for Mr. Corbel as well. Um, so as I understand it, you're saying that the tenant in a home could themselves create two separately alienable properties for purposes of Costa Hawkins, meaning in your mind, I'm wondering if it were, there's one entrance, there's you know, one room, two rooms, two bedrooms, one entrance, one bathroom. If somebody was rented an entire house and they rented out a bedroom to somebody else, in your mind, would that then also no longer be a single family home? And if not, why is that distinguishable? It might be, I, I don't know, that's not the case we have here. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that's possible that you could do, a tenant could do that. I mean, in this case, we have, have a separate unit. It has its own entrance. And we had a landlord that knew about it, who actually built that unit himself. And he knew about it and he condoned it and he consented to it. And that's the only evidence there is in the record. There's no contrary evidence to those facts. So I don't even know if we have to go to, uh, you know, the hypothetical of renting out a separate bedroom. Uh, I, I, was, I would say there's an argument there that uh, your, your ordinance would allow that, but that's not really the case we have. We have a separate unit. That's always been a separate unit. It's never been rented to any family member or member of the household of the main unit. Again, that's, that's in the declaration of Barbara Lightus. That's in the record. Nothing, nothing uh, rebuts that. There's nothing to the contrary. Uh, I think the evidence is, can only be read one way. And that's that there were two units in this structure. Therefore, it's not a single family residence under your own ordinance. That's all for questions for me. Thank you. Commissioners, any further questions for Mr. Corbel at this time? Mr. Secretary, how much time remaining does the uh, Mr. Zamek or Mr. Kang have? They have one minute and three seconds. So, gentlemen, would you like to get Mr. Zermick? Zamek? Yeah, unmute yourself. Right. Thank you. I'm unmuted now. Uh, I, I would just like to refer back to the record and the staff report. Uh, the tenant had entire total control and possession and use of the entire single family home. Uh, the expression that um, she's the only witness available uh, is rather convenient in that she can characterize the facts however she wants, and it would take uh, some kind of clairvoyance to determine the motivations of the original landlord who filed the filing back how many years ago. Um, there is an addition. It is attached to the house. Uh, but the tenant placing a refrigerator, a hot plate, a toaster oven, a microwave uh, in a room, basically, that may not have the proper wiring to support the use of those appliances, may not have a smoke detector, may not have a carbon monoxide detector, uh, and it's the tenants who created these conditions, and that is not the, the, the definition uh, mm -hmm. of a dwelling unit for the purposes of Owen or the, the interpretation of the city statutes. It's a bedrock principle uh, that these, these habitability and life safety issues are, are never voluntarily waived. That's your time. Commissioners, any further questions for either of the parties? Commissioner Maggio. Yes, for the gentleman, I would like to ask if he knows if there is an attached door to the house and the unit that was added. 
separate from its own entrance and exit. Are you asking me, me sir? Yes, I am. Yes, um, there is a, uh, a gate on the side of the house that goes around to the back. And there is a separate door that opens to the, the room that is attached to the main structure. Uh, the landlord himself never used it, never rented it. The, the tenant created the conditions that quote unquote lead to the, this determination of a second unit uh, and quite frankly asserted control over uh, our access to the property in a manner that indicates she's the sole tenant. Commissioners, any further questions? Okay, then we will go into commissioner deliberations. Commissioner Charity, would you like to begin? Sure, I'll keep this rather narrow. I um, am in favor of supporting the staff's recommendation. On the first issue, I do find this to be a single family residence. It was registered uh, as such. It's only been rented to one primary tenant. Um, on the second issue, I am inclined to reverse as staff. Uh, you know, yeah, so on the first issue, I'm inclined to reverse uh, the hearing examiner's decision. On the second one, it doesn't seem that that's in any dispute. I'm uh, ready to affirm. Uh, that this was a continuous uh, tenancy throughout the entire period of time. And um, on the last issue, I don't see that there was any conflict there either. The initial registration had this at 1150, uh, and that was the initial rent. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Commissioner Kirpies, you unmute yourself. Thank you. Sorry about that. I have questions for Ms. Regan before um, I go into my deliberations or my thoughts. Uh, Ms. Regan, uh, what is our, um, what is the commission's uh, parameters here? You know, if we're looking at the case uh, and seeing if the case applies in the Oakland uh, uh, case, if the decision in the Oakland case applies here, that's relevant, but are we able to look at how far outside of that are we able to look? Are we able to look at um, what our ordinance says, even though the ordinance wasn't necessarily spoken of directly in the um, the hearing? I mean, I, I, I suppose we are. Yeah, uh, like yeah. For, so, for example, what a dwelling unit is and what single family versus multifamily is. Right, so because this is, this is a legal question that you all are examining. So you're looking at this independently. So, um, if there are other sources that you think will aid you in, in deciding uh, whether or not this is a single family residence, uh, you can. And, and just to clarify, um, upholding uh, or going with the staff's recommendation to clarify for Mr. Cobol, that would mean that the rent limitations of the rent stabilization ordinance apply so that the rent increase that Ms. Latis received would not be in line with the rent stabilization ordinance. And then I have another question for you, Ms. Regan, about- um, Commissioner Kirby, do you mind if I interrupt? My Wi-Fi went out. Ms. Regan, would you repeat that last phrasing? Sorry about that. Yes, so the, the practical effect of, of um, going with the staff's recommendation would be that the rent limitations of the rent stabilization ordinance apply and the increased notice that Ms. Latis received uh, would, not be, um, would not be lawful. It would, it would be beyond what, what is allowed by the rent stabilization ordinance. Understood, thank you. Commissioner Kirby's apologies. No problem. And my, so my follow-up question would be, can you kind of educate us a little bit about uh, circumstances where we have duplexes or a home, a single family home with an ADU or uh, how those are affected by the rent stabilization ordinance? I don't have a specific question. I'm just kind of trying to make um, some sense. Yeah, it, you know, again, um, it does depend on the facts of the case. And I think that's why Owens is instructive here uh, because it depends on how the commission looks at this, at this house. It, it, you know, it was registered as a three bedroom house and it's only been rented to one tenant. Um, Mr. Cor Corball is making the argument that 
it's a two bedroom house with a with an additional one bedroom unit and so i think it depends on uh, and the facts are not really disputed we know what the house looks like it's it's not a detached structure it's all part of the same house even though the one bedroom has a separate or the the addition has a separate entrance and there is some uh the facts some suggest that it's um the tenant who put in uh the hot plate and the refrigerator and and other things to try to make it um separate and that we do know that it was the tenant that rented it out that the the owner mm -hmm. did not rent out that other unit so to it's kind of a long-winded way of answering your question that it's 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 very fact specific well i, I think i i am not convinced that that the oakland case is relevant here Sure, um, and that's fine. And I, I'm going to yeah. go ahead and be quiet now because that's more for deliberation. So well, the, take that question, to your fellow commissioners. My question to you, though, is forget about who's renting. I'm talking about the structures on a property. Uh, and does the rent stabilization ordinance apply based upon two factors? One, how many structures are on the property, whether it's a duplex or ADU, or and the year in which it was built? That's what I'm trying to figure out is Right. And that and, and all I can tell you is those aren't those aren't the only relevant factors. You, we don't make that determination. So if it depends on how it was initially registered, typically what the rent stabilization department does is if it's registered as a duplex with two rental units, then that's how it's treated. So in this case, it was registered as a single home with three bedrooms. So that's how it's treated by the department. And that's how it's been treated by the department since it but was if it were, registered if, in 19. If the department were to find out that it were a three bedroom single family home with an illegal unit on it, we would still apply if the rent civilization ordinance applied under at that time, we would apply that in today's, wouldn't we? So it was registered as a three bedroom. So that this is, this is a three bedroom unit. with a one. No, no, it's two bed. The, the, the third bedroom is that addition. Yes. So the, it was registered as a three bedroom house. That's not what they're, they're saying. And that's not how I saw the, the, the file. It's three bedrooms, one bathroom house. And the garage was turned into, or a portion of the garage looks like, was turned into a, that, that one room with a bathroom. Oh, well, it's in your packet. You'll, you'll have to look. My understanding is that it was a, the addition was the third, the third bedroom. Existing house has three bedrooms. So my question really is, I mean, then I guess so the fourth, so there's a fourth bedroom, I guess. I, I guess I was wrong. I mean, my question really is, doesn't have anything to do with the number of bedrooms, but I'm talking about if we had a, a home uh, that was a clear ADU in the back and they registered as a X amount of room bed home, single family home, but yet the, the city later found out that they illegally had, had done that. In addition to all the uh, code compliance issues that might come up, we would also apply the rent stabilization law if it were applicable, wouldn't we? Not, no, not necessarily. Mr. Kirby, do you want to continue with your discussion with the item? I'm still, so, okay, I'll, I'll go into my deliberations. So I'm not convinced at all that the uh, Oakland case is applicable here. So that's not going into my um, uh, consideration at all. Um, I think that it's, uh, what we can agree on is that the base rent was 1150. Um, I uh, am, I guess the only reason that why I feel that uh, this discussion about whether it it's a, um, say uh, falls under the rent stabilization ordinance or not is because, uh, well, kind of at the beginning as well, we have to say that it's a single family residence. I'm not willing to say it's a single family residence because it's not. Um, this is a uh, single family residence with um, a, an accelerate or accessory dwelling unit in the back. Who created it? You know, the, it's stipulated that the owner of the property created it. Um, who rented it is irrelevant to me. That's not what I'm looking at here. I'm looking at um, how this is going to proceed in the future. And 
so I'm not ready to overrule the hearing examiner's decision if that's the decision that says this is not a single family residence. I don't want the commission to say this is a single family residence. Um, I want the commission to say this, and we might even be uh, uh, not say anything about the number of, of units in it, but I want to come to the conclusion that this does fall under the rent stabilization ordinance because I believe it does, and the base rent is 1150. How we get there, hopefully we can get there without uh, the commission stating for the record that is a single family home because I don't believe it is. Commissioner Macchio. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I think uh, once upon a time it was a single family home. And then the owner decided to add a room a, 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 with a separate entrance. Uh, I think with the intention of renting it as a separate unit. And to me, that was established in 1990 when it was registered at $1,150. So for me, I, it, it's, I keep it more simple. I think uh, this was a three bedroom house, still has, is a three bedroom house, but now it has an additional rental unit that is separate. So I think of it as a three bedroom house with a one room unit. Commissioner Mark. Um, I think that the hearing examiner did err in the first conclusion about the maximum allowable rent. I think both parties have agreed that it can be determined. So I think that was an error. Um, I also believe that this is a two unit property with the front house and the accessory unit in the back with separate tenants. Um, the findings of fact are that the house tenant rented out the back intermittently with the landlord or the property owner's knowledge um, though possibly without permission i don't see anything tonight that would change that or show that to be in error so that's where i currently stand commissioner o'keefe uh, I agree with Commissioner Charity and the staff recommendation. I believe the base rent is established by the initial registration at $1,150. I believe it is a single family home, um, or as Costa Hawkins said, that a unit is not alienable, separate from the title to any other dwelling unit. I don't think that our own rent stabilization ordinances definition of rental unit is relevant to this interpretation of this phrase in state law. Our rent stabilization ordinance uses the word rental unit and that can apply to a single bedroom in an apartment that's sublet by a tenant, not by a landlord. Um, and also, I think that the reasons that I believe it's a single family home include that the re-registration was the landlord himself only rented the unit to one person ever. It was registered as one single three bedroom unit. The tenant said in writing in an exhibit that we have that the landlord didn't expect the back structure to survive 20 years. Um, so given that the current tenancy has lasted well over that, it doesn't seem like something that the landlord could have intended to rent because it wasn't up to code. Um, the landlord never did rent it, uh, so I agree with the staff recommendation, and I think that covers everything for me. This is one of those times that I'm glad that the chair goes last. Um, as our legal counsel mentioned, this, this matter got deep in the weeds of the Costa Hawkins, and I thought that I was fairly knowledgeable, but need a little schooling on that. First, uh, the easy part for me is the base rent. I think there's no question it's 1150. Um, normally, I would say we could remand this back to the hearing examiner for a MAR determination, but there is no way to do a MAR determination. Uh, that requires there to be existence of documents that would show um, any rent increases to, to general adjustments the landlord had taken. So um, I would agree on the base rent. Um, and this property to me um, has been and is a single family residence. Um, there's kind of a, if you know Yiddish, it's a vachachta. Um, addition sort of on the side, which reminds me of homes in Palm Springs that have casitas, where there's a separate door for your 
house guests to go into is you have a little separation of space. But this has been a single family residence since the inception of the tenancy. Uh, the property owner never had any dealings with that room in the back. It was under complete control and custody of the original tenant and the tenant surviving wife. Um, so I would be um, in favor of uh, ruling that this is a single family residency. The tenancy began prior to that December 31st, 1995 date, so that our ordinance does apply to this tenancy and that the base rent is $1,150. With that, would someone like to take a stab at a um, resolution, which the draft is 20-586? Uh, I'll do so. Thank you. I make a motion to adopt a resolution 20-586, a resolution of the Rent Stabilization Commission of the City of West Hollywood, reversing in part the hearing examiner's decision on D-4539, uh, 9004 Dix Street. Can I ask a question of staff? Sure. Is that all right? Um, Ms. Regan, if we were to uh, pass the motion that's been just been made, uh, does the commission's Binding have any uh, real bearing on uh, us stating that it's a single family home? Or are we just uh, basically stating that uh, it meets the uh, Costa Hawkins uh, exception in this way and this is our ruling? Correct, that's right. So it would have little bearing on uh, if the city at a later date determined that this was an extra unit or whatever, it has no bearing on that. I don't wanna say it has no bearing, but it would, it would be one fact, it, it would depend on all of the facts. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second on the motion? Yes, Chair, I'll make a second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Secretary, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Charity? Aye. Commissioner Kirby's? Uh, no. Commissioner Maggio? Mr. Maggio, can you unmute and repeat that, please? My answer is no. Commissioner Martz? No. Commissioner O'Keefe? Aye. Chair Burkside. Aye. So we have a 3-3 vote. I think that means the original, original ruling stands. Is that correct, Ms. Regan? That's correct. Okay. So if either parties have any questions, feel free to contact our rent stabilization uh, department. Um, did we, well, I'm sorry, can we make it separate, uh, uh, yeah. uh, another motion? Okay, sorry. Yes. Correct me. Uh, you you agree on one aspect of it. So if you want to separate that out, you well, can do if, that. If I may, if I may, just for deliberation's sake, Please. I've seen many properties in LA that have three and four structures on them. A pool house, a separate built office, uh, an attached apartment above a garage, but for their relatives visiting. But these are all single family homes. And if they were rented as such as a single family home, any tenant in that home that leased any of those separate structures on that property would be rightfully a sublease. It wouldn't create a, a, a multifamily dwelling unless it was possibly re-registered as such. And I'm not speculating what was the case in this you know, matter, but I'm just putting it out there that as Commissioner you know, Bergstein has said, we have multiple structures in LA, multiple single family homes with multiple separate structures on them. If it's just a pool house that you could live in, that's still a single family home. I don't think it changes the initial registration of this structure as a single family home. So that's all I wanted to add. Commissioner Martz. I would respectfully disagree. The registration of the property is not the sole determinative factor of what makes a property a single family home or a multi-unit um, property. So I can call anything whatever we want. It, it's the facts on the ground. And I've, I've worked on many cases um, in and around Los Angeles where there are single family homes with garages rented out. 
and illegal rental units on the property with single family homes and they've been found to be um, under rent control because they are two separate units so I, I and and those were rented by the original landlord or the tenant were they subleases that you saw Kellen or were they original the original land the original owner leasing those on I, all units both I've worked on both if I may, um, we found in our own cases that there was a tenant who rented out a bedroom to someone else. It was under rent control. These are two different issues. There's the one issue is something covered by rent control, and it is whether it's a subtenant or not, but that's rent control from the person who's the master tenant. That's a separate issue than this one, which is for purpose of Costa Hawkins, is it separately alienable? Mr. Kirpies? So I'll move that we, um, uh, I'll tell you what my intention is. So I'll move that we uh, reverse the hearing examiner in part, um, and that part is the uh, uh, having to do with the maximum allowable rent or the base rent, determining the base rent. Are you making a motion? That would be my motion. That's the intent of my motion. We can clean it up as however Ms. Regan would like to clean it up. <laughs> but the intention is to um, affirm, or I mean, it's reverse the hearing examiner's determination that uh, the mark cannot be determined or the base rent cannot be determined. So I believe it can. Can I ask, can we do that without saying anything about, I mean, we have two appealed issues before us. I feel like, don't we have to say something about both of them, Ms. Regan? Yes, I think I think what you're going to have to do because it was three three on the issue of um, whether or not it's a single family home and exempt from Costa Hawkins, and this is the separate issue of the base rent. Um, so you might have to do. I, I would suggest uh, breaking it up into into two resolutions. Um, Isn't and we could even we could even do it. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, you could even, I, I forget what the number is that we're on now, but you could do it as that number A and B. So did you you understand, to... Commissioner Mr. Kirby's? So we vote once on the base rent issue, and then you propose a separate resolution because we have to decide something on both issues that are before us, I think. Well, didn't we let the first decision stand? And then now I'm altering this, the second portion of it? But whatever we need to do, that's fine. If we need to do it two, two motions, that's fine. I mean, yeah, I think the record is clear enough. Um, if you want to to now uh, vote separately, you can, but just, I would just make it clear, uh, Chair, that the previous vote was on resolution 20-58, what is it, 6A, and now you're gonna, you're gonna take a vote on resolution 20-586B, and just make clear what that what that resolution is that you're going to vote on, and then I'll I'll um, memorialize that um, next week. <laughs> I'm going to suggest just to keep this the record really clear that we do two resolutions, 20-586A, which would deal only with the issue of the base rent, then 20-586B, which we're dealing with is the property of single family residents. I think Ms. Regan would like to reverse that just because she's already written the first one. No, that's fine. Oh, However you want to do it. I, I was okay. just going to say on the issue of the single family home, I might word it a little bit differently. Um, you're, you're looking at, um, well, you, you, yeah, you're looking at the findings of the hearing examiner and whether to uphold the hearing examiner's findings on the issue of, of exemption under Costa Hawkins or to reverse some of those findings. Looking to one of our attorneys to weigh in on this, make it a little prettier. Commissioner O'Keefe, do you want me to start? However, Ms. Regan said it, I think that's fine. I think you're saying not having the resolution worded so it mentions single family home at all. Is that correct? You're saying that we'll just we can just have a resolution that says we uphold that an exception to Costa Hawkins applies. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, th I think um, 
uh, the proposed resolution recommends reversing uh, a couple of the hearing examiner's findings, one of which is that the property is not a single family home, um, but upholding the ultimate conclusion that uh, the rent stabilization ordinance does apply so that the rent increase is improper. Uh, that's one. And then the second one is the finding about the base rent. I'm sorry, unfortunately, yes, I'm still I, confused. So we, we already voted down the first one you described, 3-3. Three, three. We probably could pa pass the base rent unanimously. And Question, that's I think, do we need a third one? Do we have oh, to actually no. have a past resolution on this question of single family home or is just defeating a resolution enough? Oh, no, 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 what, what you did was enough. And oh, okay. If you want to address the base rent, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, that's what my intent is, okay. I'm sorry. My intent is to uh, move that we, uh, reverse the hearing examiner's decision on the base rent. And we, because we believe that you can determine the base rent. That's so our motion. Ms. Regan, what's the, what's the clearest way to keep this in the record? Do we just make the a separate resolution about the base rent and leave our prior vote to stand? Y yes, I, I think that's fine. I, um, I think, um, I think what the commission can do now is is say that you're going to pass you're going to you're going to uh, make a motion to pass a uh, resolution 20-586B uh, to reverse the hearing examiner's decision reverse, reverse the hearing examiner's findings finding on the base regarding the base rent. Mr. Carpies, do you want to make that motion? Yes, ditto. There a second for that. that. Yes, I will second that. Mr. Secretary, can we have a roll call vote for that second motion, please? Commissioner Charity? I'm sorry, I was looking down, I missed it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kirby's? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Commissioner Marks? Aye. Commissioner O'Keefe? Aye. Chair Bergstein? Aye. Second motion passes said, if any parties have any questions, please feel free to contact our rent stabilization department. City Hall is currently closed because of COVID, but all of our staff are working full-time just remotely. It's rsh at weho.org. And someone to remind me, 323-848-6450 are those numbers. At this point, the parties, you are welcome to continue to um, attend the rest of the meeting, how we're going to turn off your video and your audio. With that, we will be going on to uh, new business. Item 10, we have none. Going to item 11, unfinished business, uh, the eviction moratorium. Ms. Regan, are you doing that presentation this evening or is that Mr. Noonan? I am, and I apologize that my computer is acting up. I was going to do my fancy PowerPoint presentation and share my screen with you, but sadly, it doesn't seem like it's to be. I, I had reached out to um, Peter Noonan and, and Roger to see if, if they could save me if they had somehow miraculously had access to uh, my PowerPoint, but it doesn't seem like it's available. <laughs> so, um, I will just do this orally without any visual aids. Um, but I, I really just wanted to make a, a, a couple of a couple of points with respect to the um, to the intersection really between this new state law and our eviction moratorium. So uh, because of the new state law that was passed, uh, our eviction moratorium, which allowed tenants to defer rent if they were financially impacted due to COVID-19, that had to expire as of September 30th. Uh, after that, that is uh, when the state law picks up. So from October 1st to January 31st, there's now the state eviction moratorium, which is uh, slightly different. It, it, it adds uh, some additional requirements uh, one of which is that the tenants are required to pay 25% uh, of the rent, as well as sign uh, a declaration uh, that they are financially impacted due to COVID. 
Um, these requirements are triggered um, by a 15 day eviction notice. Uh, the state has increased, it was normally a three day notice and the state uh, increased that time frame uh, to 15 days. And so these requirements are triggered by that notice. Once a landlord serves a tenant with that notice, they're required to submit this declaration of financial hardship. Um, the 25%, uh, that is not technically due until January 31st. Obviously, if the tenant is, a, is able to pay the 25%, uh, they're encouraged to do so. Uh, but the consequences to not paying that don't kick in until after January 31st. Uh, the other uh, aspect to keep in mind is that, um, oh, did you find it? I have the two slides if you wanted to use one of those timelines. I don't have your presentation though. Oh, that's okay. I think the timelines are a little, a little, yeah. Um, a little bit, yeah. Um, but thank you. So the other thing, the other aspect of our ordinance that provides a little bit greater protection than the state law is the repayment period for this deferred rent. So as you recall, our uh, moratorium began on March the 1st. And so the state law recognizes that there have been a lot of cities that had their own moratoriums in place. And so the covered, what they're calling the covered time period is from March the 1st through January 31st. So our ordinance, um, you know, people have been deferring their rent since March the 1st. And our ordinance included a repayment period. And the repayment period was keyed off of the end of the eviction moratorium. So now that we know that our eviction moratorium expired on September 30th, that 12 month repayment period began on October 1st. And so that year long repayment period is not up until September 30th of 2021. And tenants have that entire year to pay not only deferred rent that was deferred under our ordinance, but rent that was deferred under the state law. So that 75% of the rent that tenants are able to defer from October 1st to January 31st, West Hollywood tenants have until September 30th of next year to pay that back. And on top of that, the state, what I think, the state did what I think was a very, um, very kind of elegant solution to this for both landlords and tenants, that if that deferred rent is not repaid to the landlord by the end of the repayment period, the landlord can, uh, can go after that money in small claims court. It cannot be a basis for an eviction, but the landlord can still try to collect on that unpaid rent. Uh, what can be a basis for an eviction is if that 25% is not uh, paid by January 31st. So that just kind of gives you an overview of how how the two uh, how our ordinance and state law works together, and I think they complement each other um, very well. So I'll I'll stop there, and then if there are questions, I'm I'm happy to answer them. Commissioner Kirby, yeah. as so I'm I'm confused about the uh, that was new information to me about the uh, till September 30th. So. You're saying that um, under our ordinance, the city's ordinance, setting the states aside for a moment, under our ordinance, uh, if you fell behind rent in March, April, well, March 1st through September 30th, then you have, uh, you cannot be evicted for that, but you have until September 30th of 2021 to have that rent paid back. And then okay. you, you won't be evicted um, you'll, or yeah, you'll sued. never be evicted for that, but you can't be sued in small claims court until after September 30th, 2021. And it's not just for the rent deferred from March to September, it's also the rent deferred under state law from October to through January. So that's where my other question is. So it's then all of that rent from September 30th, did the state law kick in on September 30th or October 1st? No, September? no, no. Uh, the state law, but, but it's 
under state law, that's defined as COVID-19 debt. So even though it, it doesn't get incurred until later, tenants have just that, that extra bit of, so under, you know, they, they will have deferred 75% say of January rent, they'll have until September 30th, 2021 to repay that. Okay, Commissioner O'Keefe. And I know I've asked about this a couple times before, but I know our city has um, very generously and smartly, I think, put some money to nonprofits for people to, who could not make rent to help with it. And I believe last time I asked, there was not much money left, but we still had loans. Uh, it sounds like for this 25% that people have to pay or they could be evicted, it'd be really helpful to have some kind of funding available to folks. So I'm just wondering the status of, is there still a grant funding available or is it loans or how do people get that? I believe there is rental assistance, yeah. Yes, there is rental assistance available, and it is through the uh, NCJW, the uh, National Conference uh, Jewish mm -hmm. Women's Council. And we also have support through Alliance for Housing and Healing. And uh, the best way for people to access those resources is through our website at weho.org. Click on the coronavirus banner and select resident resources. Those uh, listed uh, access to the phone numbers and, and, and uh, web addresses are there. Uh, you can also access it off of our rent stabilization main page. That's weho.org backslash rent, W-E-H-O dot O-R-G backslash rent. Great, I'm so glad that we're doing that and I hope we continue to expand the funding because I think making sure people can afford to stay in their homes at this time is among the highest priorities in addition to the human cost or the human impact um, for a financial cost it's probably a lot cheaper to keep people in their own homes than than deal with the crisis afterwards Mr. Kirby's so where does the 25 percent come in uh repayment or making sure you've paid 25 percent so that's uh that's due by January 31st, and that's for October uh, through January. And to clarify, every single month starting October 1st, each tenant must pay 25% of their rent or they'll be evicted regardless of this. Um, if you Is that correct, Ms. Regan? Yes. So it's 25% of, of October, November, December, January. Correct. But you can pay zero in October and not be evicted. Correct. Not, you can, you can, no you can evictions. pay all of that until January 31st, and you cannot be evicted for that until February. Oh, OK. Thank yes. you. So how does that 25%, um, because uh, there are certain cases where many people fell behind you know, up till March or uh, uh, September, October, prior to the 25% mark. So when their landlord says, and we're now in whatever month we're in now, October, um, when the landlord says, oh, you've given me $100, what does this apply to? Um, does the, if they owe money from the prior and they owe money from the under the 25% rule, does it matter where the $100 goes? Because if it goes towards old rent, are they needing their 25%? Well, I think you know that's where our information coordinators come in, right? Because if the tenant has to make a choice, the choice would be to pay the 25% because they can't be evicted for the deferred rent and they have an extra, you know, they have 12 months essentially. They have until September 30th, 2021 to pay the deferred rent. And I guess that's where I'm getting confused about is where our law, our protections overlap with the state protections. So, um, we have until September 30th. Okay. So maybe I can, maybe it's easier to think of. So there's something that we're calling deferred rent. So the deferred rent is what the tenant is allowed not to pay. So from March to September, the tenant didn't have to pay anything. From October through January, 75% of the rent can be deferred. So all of that's considered deferred rent. So it has to be paid back at some point, but under our ordinance, it doesn't have to be paid back until sep September 30th, 2021. And then there's the 25%, 
which is part of the requirements in order to be protected from eviction for non-payment of rent. So it's the declaration and that 25%. That 25% of October, November, December, January comes due by January 31st in order for the tenant to be protected from eviction. And they can't sue me until the 30th of September because I still have that much time to pay it back for the lawsuits, right? Under the city? For the deferred rent, that's right. Yeah, for the 75%, okay. Mr. Now, you want to make a point? Yeah, just uh, legal counsel, I, there's uh, different 15 day notices for that will help tenants to navigate this that the landlord provides, is that correct? For, for instance, for the period of March through September, that's one. Yeah, I mean, that's getting a little forward. more complicated than I think we need to. So um, it, it, again, this is initiated by the landlord. So if, if a landlord say on February 1st, submits a 15 day notice, um, then the, the tenant obviously has those 15 days to pay that 25% that's due. And they provide that with a notice of the tenant's rights and other information. And so there's a lot, I, I think that there's a lot of clarity and information that needs to be provided to the tenants along with a template declaration in those cases. It, it sounds like it might be worth clarifying to any tenants that we know of that are in this position that they should probably write on their checks if they're deferring rent like 25% of October, 25% of November, 20% of 5% of December, just so it's very clear that what they're paying is not deferred rent from the prior months, that it is in fact working towards those 25%. I got a little lost in the, the dates. What is the current end date of the state's eviction moratorium? Uh, that's January 31st. So okay. ours is done and then there's the state's goes through January 31st. So if it, I'm sorry, it's a lot to digest. So if, it, if that moratorium ends, Mr. Maj, I'll be with you in just a second and a tenant does not pay rent in February, what does that trigger? Uh, well, then we're, we're back sort of where we were. So then the, the regular rules would apply. And then I'm gonna walk you through a hypothetical, which is not so hypothetical. Okay. Hypothetically, if a tenant on, in March said, I'm affected by COVID, I cannot pay my rent, ever provided a statement or a letter to the landlord, and then the rules changed in West Hollywood where you had to uh, show some kind of documentation. I wanna say it was April or May, just to show- um, August. August, some kind of documentation to say that, you know, I'm affected and this is how, you know, a bank statement or a layoff or something. If a tenant has done neither, and then come, I forget the date, but if the landlord then serves that 15 day notice, if the, could the tenant at that point, hypothetically comply at that point, go, oh, here's my checking account statements to show I'm not working for Uber, or here's my layoff notice, would that be sufficient at the point of that 15 day notice, hypothetically? So, well, so that's a great question. So the state law actually covers that now. So for months uh, before uh, October, a, a, a landlord can serve a 15 day notice. So for March, uh, that then the tenant would be required, only required to sign a declaration as laid out in the state law that they the reason they didn't pay rent was because of financial impacts due to COVID. And that's all that's required for those months uh, up until um, the 25% is required. So a tenant could essentially cure that defect, so to speak, of non-providing the, they would have that opportunity once they get the 15 day notice. That's exactly right. And a friend of mine, I've made staff aware of this, received a 15 day notice with a subsection of a $600 fine if they did not pay. That is not permissible, correct? There's that no is illegal. fines, penalties, there is nothing the landlord, okay. Commissioner Maji, okay. you have raised? Yes. Uh, yeah, and in fact, the state law itself lays out exactly the only thing that can be required uh, of the tenant to sign the exact language. So that's all there uh, in the law itself. 
we so there's no it. there's no wiggle room as to what can be required of the tenants that's right commissioners any questions mr maggio basically just a comment it's i'm glad there are these protections in place they're definitely needed but ultimately an individual will have to pay 75 percent and that could add up to thousands and thousands of dollars and how is that going to happen people are not going to be able to save that money and still meet that requirement it's just it seems like there really has to be even more protections that go even further because if your rent is three thousand a month and you can't pay it for six eight ten twelve months that's a lot of money and people are not going to be able to do that they still have to pay for their food their insurance what if they do not have jobs? I think it's a terrible situation and we probably have to find ways to even go further with our protections. Thank you. Commissioner Kirpies. Uh, the, the Democrats in Congress have actually passed a uh, resolution or passed twice uh, legislation that would help us out of, help tenants out of this situation by extending the $600 a week unemployment uh, benefits, but the Republican leadership continues to not bring it up for a vote, continues to blame Democrats for not moving moving the country forward in this area. Um, and so that's the problem. I mean, that's the state doesn't have money. You and I don't have money. The federal government has money and they're not giving it to us. And it's because of the Republican leadership and the, and the craziness that we have in the White House. I'm just going to, you know, normally I chime in and say, as the only landlord on this commission, however, I can no longer say that Commissioner Martz is a, a landlord to an extent, as is Commissioner Maggio. I want to talk about just a bit um, how this is affecting landlords. You know, the large corporations certainly have the ability to shoulder um, less income coming in, but most of the landlords, particularly in West Hollywood, they're, we're small landlords, mom and pop, mom and mom, pop and pop, and uh, landlords are being forced in position of providing housing um, at no cost or at that 25%. Um, and I all do respect Ms. Regan, I, I disagree with your analysis of the elegance of the state's solution of allowing uh, landlords to take a tenant small claims court. That really is not a solution. Um, there is a process of small claims, but to collect on a small claims judgment is uh, it's onerous. Um, the amount of work to hire someone to uh, track down an employer or track down a bank account to levy. Um, so it's a separate conversation. I think that we as society are way past due having a conversation of basically housing by right, um, where every single human being on the planet should have a place to live at a price that they can afford, but I don't think it should be on the backs of private landlords. And that's just my landlord rant. Rant, not rent. Commissioners, any further questions or comments for Ms. Regan at this time? Ms. Regan, could you maybe send us your PowerPoint presentation just so we have that as a reference? I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Okay. And thank you for what the city and the staff are doing to, for our tenants one-on-one -on -one and then also for these policies that you've put in place. Uh, going on to item 12, public comments. Uh, Mr. Secretary, are there any members of the public waiting to speak? Not at this time. Thank you. Uh, going on to item 13, commission comments, commissioners. Commissioner Martz. Yes, I have one. Um, another resource for people that are looking for COVID funding. LA Regional COVID Fund has grants. They've been going on for a number of months. There's another fund opening up on October 26 and goes only until the 30th. So you have to apply quickly. And it gives grants from five to $25,000 for businesses, nonprofits, um, solo entrepreneurs the rounds change who's eligible each time so you'll have to go on and and do a little research but um that's a a good resource i know a couple of nonprofits were able to get funding earlier in the year and the website is lacovidfund.org that's it. a good question i think the county of los angeles had rental assistance, but I believe that's expired. Anyone aware if the county funding for tenant assistance is still available? I think that the deadline passed on that. I think that's done from my recollection. 
Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kirby, you got your hand raised? Yeah, I have two things. One is, um, uh, as everyone knows, I work for Assembly Member Richard Bloom. And on October 27th, which is Tuesday, I believe, or 28th, um, we are having a state of hate uh, panel discussion. Uh, there's been a rise in the last deck. It's going to review um, the last decade. We're going to have four panelists um, that study uh, hate incidents and hate crime, and they're going to discuss uh, how over the last decade, what we've seen in terms of hate incidents. Uh, and you can go to our Facebook page or to our website, which is asm.ca.gov forward slash bloom. Good luck with that. Just Google Richard Bloom and <laughs> you'll find our website. Uh, the second thing um, is having to do with the, uh, coming back to the commission stuff, you know, a couple months ago, uh, Chair, we had elected you, um, give you a, a second term to kind of make up for uh, some of the lost months uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic when the city wasn't meeting. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, based upon that conversation we had back then, I wanted to bring up a, uh, ask that we've agendized for the next meeting, a discussion on uh, the chairmanship and the, um, that's, that's it. I was gonna go into more discussion, but that's more discussion. <laughs> I'll second. Okay. I'm gonna turn to staff on this because Yvonne Corker touched on that point when she met with us. Um, I don't know if we would need to include her on that. I've had a discussion with her you, and she said at that time, you can't do a term as a partial term. Either a chair is elected for a term or they're not. I will just say kind of offhand, um, some of you know me for a very long time that I have always been a extremely ethical commissioner, I believe, and that um, I have the best concerns of the commission in the city and I have some ideas on that, but it's not, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to discuss that at the commission level. So if you wish to have a discussion, I would suggest we include Yvonne Quarker on that. We can, yeah, she, she can definitely be invited. I don't know if she'll be available, but I would like that on the next agenda. Uh, well, let let us um, let us have a conversation with her um, next week, or the, and we'll figure it out, and we'll get back to you all about that. Can I? Um, is it all right if I speak on this? Yes. The question of agendizing. It. So I was the one I think that nominated you, uh, Chair Bergstein, to have a second term with the understanding of all the conversation that we'd all had that although Yvonne, the um, city clerk had advised that she didn't think it was in the spirit of it to have a partial term that it seemed like the sense of the commission that the language was that it was our right to um, to go ahead and not having planned it, you know, to be able to bring up the issue again. Um, so that was the understanding with which I made the nomination. We'd all agreed that we would have rotating seniority um, and you know, it seems like it might be time for someone who hasn't been chair in a long time to have a chance based on that, um, all of the assumptions that we went into. This is going beyond the Brown Act, what we can have discussions about, so. Okay. So anyway, I'd just suggest that we go ahead and vote on it so it can be on the next agenda. And if we have to pull it because we're told we can't, then we don't have to. Mr. Maggio? Well, we're having a discussion about it now and that's inappropriate, but to ask for it to be agendized is very appropriate. So we need to make a motion for it to be agendized in a second. And that has happened. All right. So can we have right. a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Charity? Aye. Commissioner Kirby's? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Commissioner Martz? Aye. Excuse Commissioner me. Commissioner Aye. Aye. Uh, Chair Berkstein? Aye. Motion passes. Commissioner Kirby's, while you have the microphone, did you want to, as your government official, talk anything about the elections coming up? Oh, no, no, no. I was going to say, great job on the census. It's done. We're, <laughs> the number's in. <laughs> anything about voting? No, everyone needs to get out and vote. If they haven't voted already, I've already voted. <laughs> everyone else should, too. In the commission comments, Commissioner O'Keefe? I'm gonna do election observing for the Arizona Democrats on election day, which will be the most around people I've been with N95. So if anybody's interested, let me know. They have good training and we can make sure to protect people's voting rights. I'll just add to that. Oh, go ahead. 
I just had a question. You're doing it in Arizona, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a <laughs> okay. State. I'll let you know that day oh. if I want to go over with you. <laughs> that's awesome, Commissioner O'Keefe. I'm also doing that, so I will be going to Nevada to the wonderful city of Reno. Any other commission comments at this point? Item 14, staff comments. I wanna take a moment and do encourage everybody to vote. And also note that we do have ballot drop boxes in the city of West Hollywood. These drop boxes are located at Plummer Park by the community center at the main entrance at the West Hollywood City Hall. It's by the parking structure on Sweetser and at West Hollywood Library located along San Vicente. These are brightly colored boxes. You can't miss them. The top's orange, there's blue, and there's white. Uh, we also have four in-person voting places in the city. This is Laurel Elementary School at 925 North Hayworth Avenue. That's actually Los Angeles. Uh, it's Fairfax Senior Citizens Center at 7929 Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles. And then the Iranian American Jewish Federation, 1317 North Crescent Heights Boulevard and Plummer Park Community Center, 7377 Santa Monica Boulevard. So four polling places in or near West Hollywood and three voter drop off areas. If you need those addresses or locations, you can find that information on our website again at weho.org. That's www.weho.org. Thank you. I thought that I read that the Lapeer, I think it's the Lapeer Hotel was also a, a polling place. I think I saw that. That is correct. It's uh, uh, Kimpton Lapeer Hotel, 629 North Lapeer Drive. I'm using the LA County Vote Center's website and typing in West Hollywood, California for the locations on these polls. So that is accessible off of our website. If, if you do need to have that uh, locations directly, uh, the LA County Vote Center's website. Uh, it's a location-based map. You do have access it, to it from the West Hollywood um, website, and that will provide your vote, your closest voting location if you type in your address. I would just add that there's a neat little tool on the LA County Registrar's Office. 25% of registered uh, West Hollywood voters have already voted. So that's exciting. And you can vote uh, at landmarks like the Biltmore or Dodger Stadium. So you can, anywhere in the county where there's a vote center, you can vote. Commissioner Kirpies? I, I thought Allison was gonna say it already, but uh, also on the, the county, um, where's, or it's actually at the state, I think, but where's my ballot? Um, go to where's my ballot, it's really cool. You can see your, wherever your ballot is in the stages. And I know that mine has been received and accepted. So I don't have to worry about my signature, not reading right, anything like that. Mine's accepted. And it's gonna be counted. <laughs> I signed up and I signed up and I received texts. So I had text messages when it uh, was received and processed by the post office and received by the registrar. It was pretty great. Yeah. Ditto. I, I was concerned that maybe my scrawl had changed over the years. I'm gonna reject my ballot, but uh, it, I got a text when it was received and a text when it was accepted. Wishes any further comments? If not, then we will adjourn to our next meeting of the Rent Stabilization Commission on um, Thursday, November 12th, 7 p.m., virtually here online. Thank you all. Good meeting all. Good night. Right. Take care, everyone. Hello, WeHo. It's Eddie Robinson from WeHo TV News. The coronavirus has turned our world upside down, and the city of West Hollywood is protecting health and safety and supporting businesses during the pandemic by turning the inside out. Introducing outdoor use temporary zones. Out zones provide outdoor commercial space and public rights of way, marked with colorful signage. 